Good evening. Welcome to the Board of Selectmen meeting for the 6th of November. Hope everybody's voted. Uh, roll call, please. Wayne Miller present. Sulicio present. So the meeting is called to order. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, I'd like to announce that the meeting is being tape recorded. Uh, 1.4 Chairman's additions or deletions. We're amending section 3 appointments and hearings to include the joint meeting that was posted in accordance with 3 1. F1 <laughs> of the Towns and Charter uh, clarif and clarify agenda item 5.7. Um, what I would like to do, if the um, rest of my board doesn't mind, <laughs> is can we take 2 1 and get that one done and then move 2 2 and 2 3 to the end of the meeting? That's fine. Okay. So, hate to do this to you guys, but 2.1, we have an executive session. Public comment. Oh, public comment. I'm sorry. Anybody want to make a comment publicly? Yes. I haven't been to a, a board meeting for a while. Is the public comment for items on the agenda? Whatever you like. Or do we wait until an item comes up and then put a pause up? No, I'd, I'd prefer that you... If you have something to say about something on the agenda, I'd prefer that you say it now. Sure. Okay. Laura Doyle, Meadow Road. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, Laura. I didn't hear your last name. Doyle, D-O-E-L-L, -L, Meadow okay. Road. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of comments about uh, the appointment tonight for the Conservation Commission because I know it's someone who is a spouse of someone who's on the Conservation Commission, and I came before you uh, the previous time that you were the chair. Um, someone else on the board a long time ago tried to get a relative on the board um, and I have the same concerns now that I had then. I know two people who have gone to meetings and applied uh, board and park and Pat Jumelo and they weren't even considered and I, I don't understand why we're passing over people who are volunteering and considering people who don't live in town um, and people who are with two family members on that particular position. I'm very Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, Chief Davis. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to uh, remind everybody that we had a drug take back day a couple weekends ago. We had quite a few people come in, probably approximately 2,000 drugs were recovered and wow. destroyed. And that box is in the lobby, I mean, inside the, just inside the lobby of the police station every day of the week. Any time of day, if somebody wants to bring something in, we can help them. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so 2.1 executive session. Could we get a motion, please? I move that we move into executive session pursuant to General Law C30A. S21A3 to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining, bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have been detrimental effect on the bargaining position or litigating position. And the chair so declares, asks me police union grievance. And I'll second that. All uh, those in favor, roll call please. Wayne Miller, yes. Sue Lucia, yes, and we will be returning to Correct. Um, exec yes. and to public session. Um, I'm sorry, maybe because of where we're at, I I can't even send you to a room other than the library. Can you, oh, would you, Karen? That'd be wonderful, thank you. Welcome back. Uh, just as an FYI to the public, we, um, we did settle a grievance from the police, with the police union. Um, just now, and we'll be taking a vote to um, town meeting to appropriate some funds to uh, to do that. 
so we're skipping down to 3.1605 joint meeting with the planning board to appoint Charles Sexton Duranian did I say that right to the Duranian to the planning board effective November 6 2018 to the next annual town election Wayne um, you you guys all we're here just to bring the motion forward because we had a joint meeting posted. Okay. It was a joint meeting posted. So, so I'll open a meeting, but we're not a full board anyway. But I'm representing the board with the motion that we made and passed at our meeting. I thought you needed, if it's a joint meeting, you need a quorum. Do you have a quorum? No. We have a quorum when we appointed Jerry Lynn. Correct. Oh, okay, because of the position. I got I've got you. All right. We're good. Okay. So the what motion do you by our board was unanimous to appoint for the motion that you read. Would is this the state position? No, it's a vacancy on the board. Oh, just a regular vacancy. All just right. Just a regular vacancy. Planning. It was so, Christmas seller. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Position that was. Um, he resigned. Okay, so. So it's just, only until the next election. So just a motion. I move the board appoint Charles Sixon Duranian to the planning board effective November, November 6, 2018, to the next uh, annual town election. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 We're done. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure you want to do this, Jazz. <laughs> You're going to be a busy, busy guy. Okay. Um, Three point two. Six ten p.m. Town Council. Adam Costa is here to discuss the Board of Selectmen priorities. Welcome, Adam. For those of you who don't know, this is Adam Costa. He's our new chief town council. Welcome. Thank you. So welcome. Glad to have you aboard. It's good to be here. Um, you want a list? <laughs> <laughs> I do. Um, do you want to start? I'll let you start. Uh, I don't know where to start. You don't know where to start. <laughs> I do. I have this list. That I know you have a list. I have a list. I make lists, don't I, Jim? Mm -hmm. I do. <laughs> okay. Um, we're working on the charter. Yes. The hope is, uh, this is John Page. John is the, the chair of the Charter Review Committee. Okay. Um, they're chomping at the bit to talk with you folks. So we will work out logistics of time and, and all that. You're going to do town hall hours at some point. I am. So we, we agreed that we provide monthly uh, office hours. Mm -hmm. So as you know from the interview process, the idea behind office hours is that we find a period of time. Usually it's approximately a half day. We can structure it so in one instance it's in the morning, in another instance it can be later in the day. Sometimes it will uh, be partly during, op during regular business hours and partly into the evening hours so that it can accommodate both municipal officials and, and volunteer board members who might have full-time jobs during regular business hours. And the idea is that it's an opportunity for municipal employees, special employees, volunteers to come to set up a time to meet with me if they've got specific questions about uh, municipal governance generally or about a specific matter that might be before uh, their department or uh, a board or a commission. Okay, so John is one that would probably want to be on the agenda pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, so if maybe if you can coordinate the, the times. That's okay. fine. I can talk with Jim and we can set up a time that works okay. well. Okay. Who's going to keep the, the schedule? We'll figure that out. Okay. I'll let you figure it out then. <laughs> I've got some ideas. It's done different way in different communities. Sometimes okay. it's more formal than others. In, in some communities, it's more formal than others. Uh, 
we've used online scheduling apps, which some communities prefer, other communities don't. Uh, I've got one community that uses an old-fashioned scratch pad. Individuals come That's into town hall and they, where we're at <laughs> they, right they sign in. <laughs> uh, so however you prefer to do it, there, there are different options. Okay, all right. So we've got charter, we've got planning, who's working on something that I'm sure you're familiar with, and that's um, marijuana. Rec mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I know the marijuana one is, is one that they want to get moving on. There's also something having to do with... Uh, yeah, but a ballot vote as well. For the marijuana? For the marijuana thing. So... Um, so that'd be a, a, a potential prohibition. Is that yeah. what triggers the triggers the ballot? Yeah, that's fine. We can we can take a look. Okay. We've, we've done that in a number of communities too. I'm it's sure you have. <laughs> I'm sure you have. It's a hot so that's, topic that's, these days. Dust that off and. Sure. Um, it's our chairman that would like to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we'll work out the logistics of that. So we've got charter uh, planning. Housing authority is. Um, hoping to finish doing some plans for a contract to do veterans housing. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sure they're going to need and want your advice on what comes first and how to go about that. Sure. Um, policies. Policies. Uh, you and I talked a little bit about policies in, in our meeting. Um, personnel policies in general, and then some general policies as well. And I'm almost thinking that we could do a work session perhaps on that, just so that everybody has a, a level is level set in terms of what the expectations are, what does it mean, what do these policies mean, what, te what teeth do they have, um, or, no or not. Okay. Sure. Um, and if there are specific policies that any of the board members would like me to pay particular attention to in advance of that meeting, you can let me know and what, I can give What did you have on your list? Uh, that was the big one, and um, Adam and I discussed that last week. As well, the uh, policies and personnel general. in yeah. general. Yeah. Um, and we had some that we postponed last week. Yes. Can yeah. we get a? Uh, can we get those to Adam? Sure. Those were, you had brought up a couple. One Networks, was social media. Social media. Uh, board of selectmen. There was some drafts information in there that was never corrected. Um, I don't remember that one. Mm -hmm. Carolyn, do you remember there was another one? The personal service contract, the social media, the code of conduct. Code of conduct, conduct is the one that I was thinking of that Wayne had, had asked for. If you could forward those to, to Adam. Um, what else? Oh, we're working on the master plan, too. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And where are you in that process? Uh, we had the first set of public comment periods um, and information gathering. We had five sessions, I think it was. Um, it's been kind of stagnant for the summer in these first couple of months, uh, just due to scheduling. Um, but it's kind of infancy. We, we tried to contract it out last year. Um, or at least a portion of it, and that did not go well. Um, we were overpromised, underserved by the company we contracted with, so um, we decided to try to bring it in-house as much as we could. Um, got some appropriation money from the planning board. Um, so it, it's in its infancy, I would say, still, um, but it needs to start getting picked up again. Do you have a master plan committee? Yes. Okay. And yeah, the committee's been um, formed and started meeting at the beginning of last year. Um, I'm on it, the only reason I know. So, um, and we're just trying to do the best we can. So the, the next thing to happen is the um, public survey. Uh, we created one on the first Survey Monkey that's supposed to be going out um, once we finalize that. And then from there, we'll start building the 
each of the individual modules, if you will, um, that are called out in the charter. So, okay. There's another um, another thing that we're in the middle of too, um, discussion about regional communication dispatch. Um, discussion about exiting as well as entering into a new um, regional agreement, if you will, with um, a couple of our neighbor towns, hopefully. So simultaneously, both of those efforts have begun. Okay. Jim can give you an update on where we're at with, with both, okay? That'd be great. I think those are the... Those are the big ones. Those are the big ones. You've got a special town meeting in early to mid-December, is that right? Yeah, is that on the agenda yet? It is. Yep. Yeah. yeah. We have to, we have to nail down the date. We're, we're, we'll do that tonight. We'll okay. be nailing that one down. All right. And so you'll just keep me aware of anything that's uh, out of the there. usual. Yeah. Uh, aside from the scheduling, I can work <laughs> that with Jim. But anything out of, out, of the, out of the ordinary that you might need some advance input on? Um, I don't know. Lori, do you know if planning has any plans for the special town meeting for something going on? We do have a submittal. On we do? Okay. For, uh, We're going to talk extended, about that, too. Extended moratorium on the yes. adult use marijuana. Okay, so that's something that you're going to want to work with um, Lance, Lance McNally on. Last night, I'm the assessment of planning. And that's going to be on the special as well? That's the plan, yes. Yeah. Okay. We're going to make updates based on what happened at the hearing last night on the input right. from the hearing. Um, and I'm judging them. So it sounds like Lance needs to get on that, on his list. Okay. All righty. Do you have any questions? I don't. Not at the moment. Do I will. Think, do you think we have enough to do? <laughs> I'm sure you've got enough to do. <laughs> <laughs> You'll keep me busy. Yes, we will. We will. Anything else? No, but I reserve the right to come back to that. You, <laughs> you always have the right to come back to that, Wayne. Okay. Appointments of officials personnel. 4.1. Appoint Richard T. Lee as a substitute van driver for the Towns and Council on Aging, effective November 6, 2018, contingent upon the passing of a quarry check and a medical exam. Wayne? I move the board appoint Richard T. Lee as a substitute van driver to the Towns and Council on Aging, effective November 6, 2018, contingent upon the passing of a quarry check and medical exam. Second. Any questions? Nope. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. 4.2, appoint Anne Le Lequeer to the Conservation Commission for a term effective November 6, 2018 to June 30th, 2020. Before I make a motion, I, I was had this correspondence today as well with okay. another um, citizen mm -hmm. expressing concern, much like, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Laura. Laura. Um, um, that we hold off on this appointment until we get more information from the Conservation Committee. Okay, anything in particular you want from the Conservation Commission? Um, just an explanation as to uh, what the process was with knowing that there were multiple volunteers. Um, I am a little concerned with the having two family members on that again. I don't know the background on any of this and I just wanted to investigate a little bit further as to what um, what the process was. Okay. I don't have any problem with that. Do you have a m mm hmm If I may? You may. Okay. Conservation has unanimously appointed Ian, my wife. I have signed the uh, proper documents for non-disclosure that's been certified by Kathy Spofford. And everything has been done by the books the way it's supposed to be approached and handled. And I see no reason why this should be delayed for any reason whatsoever. Thank you for your input. Um, sure. 
does the Conservation Commission appoint or does the board appoint? Conservation Commission recommends. recommends. Right. Okay. So I think, um, Jimmy, if you could send something off. Thank you. Um, just to supply us with some more information on how the appointment choices are done. Um, I too had received, um, I, I had received a cor some correspondence saying um, they didn't understand why at least one other person was, um, was turned down previously. So um, I'd, I'd like to hear an explanation on that as well. Um, the other thing that I would ask for, because because it's the Conservation Commission, because of all of the legalities, all of the special acts, the 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 laws regarding conservation, I think we've gotten to the point in town. It's just my opinion. I don't know how how Wayne feels, but. We got to start looking at at some um, some of these choices, not just as somebody raised their hand, but also what kind of qualifications do they have, especially for a board that's as important as as conservation. Um, we got to start looking at what kind of background, what kind of education, and and certifications, whatever. Um, so that's just my opinion, and I want people to know where I'm coming from. Okay. So we will pass over that. Do you need to? Okay, thank you. 5.1, review approved license to sell Christmas trees on the Towns and Common for Frank Farisi on behalf of the Lions Club from November 23rd, 2018 to December 24th, 2018. I move the board approve license to sell Christmas trees on the Towns and Common for Frank Farise on behalf of the Lions Club from November 23rd, 2018 to December 24th, 2018. Second. Any questions? Nope. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Carolyn, did we decide we're going to do the next one? Um, we have another meeting before the scout does. Um, let's let's hold off on five two, please. Okay. I'd rather do it closer to when he's going to have his ceremony. Five three unregistered vehicle complaint. Regarding 92 Turnpike Road. Mm-hmm. That's the one. This is my report. Investigation of a complaint about unregistered motor vehicles on the property at uh, 92 Turnpike Road, Townsend. On 11-30-18, I was accompanied by Deputy Police Chief Sartell to investigate a complaint received on 11-28-18 of unregistered motor vehicles at the above address. We did not go on to the property, but observed from the road several of what appeared to be, quote, junk and or unregistered motor vehicles visible or partially visible from the street. I took eight pictures that are attached that identify a minimum of, of nine vehicles without visible license plates. The nine vehicles included at least two pickup trucks and one tractor trailer with a trailer attached, all within 75 feet of the roadway and an apparent violation of the Townsend bylaw for unregistered vehicles. To my knowledge, this property is not licensed as a junkyard or to sell motor vehicles or for any use that allows these vehicles to remain on the property. The view from the road was not conducive to accurately identifying other vehicles further back from the roadway, although under 
identified debris may include additional vehicles. An aerial view using Google Maps confirms that this may be the case. Signed, Sulicio, 11518. So I would entertain a motion to send a letter to the owners of 92 Turnpike Road, according to the bylaw, to give them notice, according to that bylaw. I move the board um, send a um, letter stating that the said property, 92 Turnpike Road, is in violation of the bylaw and um, corrections need to be made according to the bylaw. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? All right. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Five four review comment on zoning board of appeals special permit referral regarding five harbor trace. Any comments on that? No. I have none. I have none. Um what do we usually do? Thank you for the referral. Mm -hmm. Do you want a motion for that? Is that how we typically do? I haven't gotten one it of these in a while. It does it both ways. Yeah. Done as a motion before and just as a comment before. What so. would you prefer? I think comment is sufficient. Okay. Thank you for sending it to us. We have no comments. 5-5, five, five, discussion reco regarding a request for an LRTA advisory board member. Jim, can you talk a little bit about what that is? Certainly. Um, the letter is pretty self-explanatory, but for the audience, the Town of Townsend is a member of the Lowell Regional Transit Authority, or the LRTA. The LRTA works with the local council on aging to provide funding to assist with senior transportation along with providing paratransit vehicles for this transportation. The LRTA has not had a representative from the Town of Townsend for approximately two years. As a chairperson of the Board of Selectmen, you or your designee are eligible to be the representative of the LRTA Advisory Board. Our advisory board generally meets the fourth Thursday of the month with no meeting in July or August. Please consider the request as an invitation for yourself or your designee to be a member of the LRT LRTA Advisory Board. So, I don't know about you, Wayne. I don't think I can take a number. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Um, this is the one that we um, we work with them for the Council on Aging, right? Yeah, Kari is yeah. nodding her head in the back room. Yeah. Do you think the Council on Aging would recommend someone? I would recommend that um, we bring this up at the Council on Aging meeting. Could you? Um, and I'm sure that we could forward to the board some recommendations for this meeting. That'd be wonderful, because I think it fits more for, for this stuff that you, you do. Okay? That'd be great. Thank you. Do you need a copy of this? I would love one. Have mine. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're meeting in a couple of weeks. I don't know when. When is your? Uh, third Tuesday of the month. Okay, so that might work. <coughs> Thank you. Five six discussion regarding closing town hall to the public on November twenty third, December twenty fourth, and thirty first. Discussion. What do we usually do, Jim? Okay. Defer to Carolyn. I think this is what you usually do. Well, um, it depends on the holiday falls. Always on Thanksgiving, traditionally the boards voted to close to the public only because a lot of employees take that day off and the offices aren't staffed. Um, employees can still work if they want. They just have some downtime. You and I have spoken about um, Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve because it's on a Monday and the holiday is on a Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And you might run into that same situation where there's not enough staff for the offices. Up. We could certainly ask at a department meeting. Well, why don't we handle the day after Thanksgiving at least, okay? Um, and then bring back the others. Jim, if you want to talk to, to the department heads. Certainly. See what they, what it looks like. Um, if, if you don't mind, I can tell you that the Council on Aging and the Library Trustees have already voted to 
I mean, I don't have any problem closing for all no, three. I don't either. I mean, do you want to do a motion? I move the board approve closing of town hall to the public. Town and hall and, and and other town departments. Is that no, non-essential? Non-essential. No. Please have to work. <laughs> 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 Police have to work. Fire has to work. Sorry. Uh, closing town hall to the public on November 23rd, December 24th, and 31st. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And what happens? Um, people can take vacation they can time. They take their personal for time that. if they choose. Okay. They can also choose to use the time without interruptions to get some stuff done. Okay. So they can come in and work if they want to. Okay. Five seven. Vote the opening and closing dates for the warrant of the special town meeting to be held on December 11th. And I think there was a change in its schedule on that. There was, Madam Chair. Um, there's a document in your packets, five seven, and you've already voted to open the warrant. Notice has gone out that the warrant's been open. The uh, closing of the warrant is contemplated as November 20th with any articles that come in going to town council for review with the 27th being the date that the warrant would be posted. Originally December 11th was contemplated as the date for the STM to be held but with that scheduling issue you and I had talked about the possibility of pushing that to Thursday the 13th instead of Tuesday the 11th. I think we're probably going to have to do that. Is that going to work for you? Can you make it work? One second. As of right now, yes. Good. Um. So then it would be appropriate for a motion to close the warrant for the special town meeting on November 20th and to call the date of the special town meeting as Thursday, December 13th at 7 p.m. in Memorial Hall. You got that motion? Oh, uh, sorry. So the November 20th one? Is that the yes, one? Mo motion to close the warrant on November 20th, 2018 at the close of business and to call the special town meeting for Thursday, December 13th at 7 p.m. at Memorial Hall. I move the board approve closing the special town meeting warrant on November 20th and to schedule the special town meeting for Thursday, December 13th at 7 p.m. at Memorial Hall. And that's in the year 2018, 2018. right? <laughs> I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Can I ask a question about that? Sure. With respect to the planning board and the articles for the special town meeting, does that mean then that they need to be to you verbatim by the 20th of November? Needs to be sent to town council, and I believe we've already sent this off to planning, right? Correct. Lance had this already based on us thinking it was the 11th, but now it's two days after. The, the articles would need to be nearly complete. Um, there could be a motion to make amendments on the town meeting floor and the moderator has ultimate okay. jurisdiction. As long as and, we can do that. But they, they, can't be, they can't be done in a fashion that makes what has been publicly noticed more restrictive. So if, for instance, okay. you say, you know, it, can, it has to be 25 feet from you know, the setback, you can't on the floor make it 15 because people were told in the warrant that it was going to be 25 and that might have been fine by them and then if they wake up the next day and find out that it's been made more restrictive their rights have been impacted because they might have wanted to come so you just can't make it more restrictive by motion okay or by amendment um or by amendment so whatever we uh, you're talking about what we published for yesterday's hearing 
it can't be more restrictive than what we published for yesterday's meeting? No. What, what can yeah. be more restrictive is, I mean, at your hearing, if presumably you hear public input and somebody makes comments that you deem are appropriate to make changes, the planning board will consider those changes, make them. What ultimately is submitted to the warrant on or before November 20th yes. is... We don't have a meeting until the 26th. Well, then maybe you're going to have to have another meeting. Okay. okay? I mean, that's why... That's why we published this too, was to give you guys plenty of notice as to what dates you had to hit. So sometimes you have to have an extra meeting. Okay? Okay. I mean, you don't want something like a calendar. We might need to push out to the annual, we'll see. Um, For which? There's nothing, there's nothing lost by doing that. You know, by putting it on the annual instead of the special town meeting. For which, we, for, one of, for which one? Not the marijuana. accessory apartment. Right. The one we right. had the hearing the for yesterday. Marijuana is a different story, but for the accessory apartment. So, so the one that I'm concerned with is the marijuana one, which is the one that Lance was concerned yes. with, which is why we sent out the dates to him before. Okay? So back and talk to Lance if you want. We give Lance a call, make sure he understands that, please. Yeah, I think there's a go that you already have, you've already submitted your draft to that. It's basically a pretty boilerplate extension of the moratorium. Yeah. The more, yes, the marijuana yeah. is fine. Um, okay, so if you need to work on the other one for longer and make it for the town meeting, that's fine too. Okay. Okay? I, I mean, basically that's your choice. If you don't think it's going to be ready in time and it's too much of a rush, then plan on it for April. Okay. Okay? You're ready. Five eight, review approved change order number nine for the West Townsend Fire Station project. Jim, do you want to talk yes, to Madam this? Chair, um, what the Chief is looking for here is a tweaking of what was the original change order number one. You recall change order number one was when they changed the elevations um, for the project for drainage reasons. Mm -hmm. um, what they didn't anticipate was that there'd be an additional expense for um, Ducharme and Dillis to do some adjustments of the site and sewerage plans. So there's a $950 additional expense. So they'd be looking for the change order approval of $950 and there are funds sufficient within the contingency. Uh, I move the board approve change order number nine for the West Holland Fire Station project. Second. Any other discussion? No, pretty straightforward. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Five nine review and approve the towns and meeting hall policy. Karen, you're still here. All right. Okay. <laughs> History on this. This had come to the board quite a while ago, and then it got worked on a little bit, and then got the dust taken off of it just a couple weeks ago. Right. You have any questions? No. Remember this a couple, couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and everybody's still okay with this? This comes back with the approval of everybody from, from these buildings, correct? Okay. okay. Then move the board approve the Towson Meeting Hall policy. Uh, this is reading one. Correct. So the, the first reading. First reading. Right. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. So if we can put that on the agenda for the next meeting as well, please, Carolyn. Thank you. 510, discuss a point of Board of Selectmen's representative <laughs> <laughs> for the Capital Planning Committee. Cindy, where are you? Um, hmm. When does this all start? When do we start up with capital? Last week. Thank you. 
So is is Cindy still on? Or is that a yearly appointment? Yeah, yearly, so she's done. The draw straws. Mexican gunfight. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot. What does it entail? I guess is my question. Well, all of the folks that are looking for is it more than ten thousand dollars? What's the capital cutoff? Capital is it's similar to your budget hearings that you went through last year, Wayne, and you develop a five-year plan and you submit for a uh, capital article. So this would be to sit on that board, correct? Mm -hmm. right. And listen to what they want, why they want it, and figure out what's our five-year plan. Okay. I, if I do it, I just can't promise I make every meeting. Okay. Well, I move that Wayne Miller be our appointee for the Capital Planning Commission. I would like to second. Again. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Come on. I said yes. All right. It's Wayne. Six one. Town Administrator updates and report. Madam Chair, um, coming at the specific request of Selectman Miller, we have the Chief and the Deputy Chief here this evening to speak about police staffing update and police vehicle um, purchase versus lease. Want to come closer? Sure. Well, you can move up a little bit even if you want. It's okay. You don't have to sit way back there. We don't fight. Just up on What are you going to cover first? Well, if it pleases the board, I can give you just a brief overview of our hiring status. On October 22nd, we hired a full-time police officer, Jim, Jim Landy, uh, to replace uh, the retired Sergeant John Johnson. A real quick turnover, as you guys know, he, uh, he recently left employee in January, so it was a real quick turnover. We did a quick uh, overview, some training, some firearms training, got him on the road. He's actually actually working shifts as we speak, which is pretty decent. Um, we have two other full-time openings. One would replace Mark Francis's position as a school resource officer when that position got shifted over to the school resource side. We have that opening. We have an applicant currently in background. The application deadline for the academy for that position is at the end of January. The academy starts in March. You can project out about six months. Some training about this time next year, if we're lucky, that person will be uh, working calls on their own. The second one would be to replace a, an officer that resigned last month. Uh, testing is in process. We do have a couple of people in the pipe for that. We have interviews scheduled for the next two Fridays, the 9th and the 16th. We have a few reserve officers um, in, in process as well, both applicants either testing and or uh, are in background. Uh, challenges, as I, as I told the board last time, but I'd like to reiterate, are uh, the academy tuition is about $3,000. If we do end up hiring two non-certified people in this budget cycle, that would be $6,000 we didn't plan for. Uh, certainly, I will look and scrub as best I can to find it, but that is just a consideration I'd like to bring to the board's attention. Uh, the second thing is I've done a little bit more research relative to academy scheduling and find it to be incredibly sporadic. I've talked to directors over a number of different academies. I've got a few more alternatives, but suffice to say that scheduling is very, very difficult uh, to work in. That's creating a, a bit of uncertainty for us. One, the geographical implications. This person has to commute daily uh, to the academy, so certainly we can't have Where that. is it? That's the issue. We have, uh, there's a number of them. The one that we have a, an applicant in now is in Randolph, Mass. Uh, luckily enough, when we hired him, he was in Medford, so it wasn't bad of a commute for him, but that certainly wouldn't be an academy we could use regularly. There's too much of a demanding commute daily for that applicant. And so, review for me, who's who's the academy? Who does these academies? It's MPTC is a sanctioning body, Municipal Police Training Council. It's a certifying body in Massachusetts. Uh, they run a, a number of regional academies across the state. Ours was Boylston, which has historically been the one that Townsend has used. Uh, they're still open for in-service, but not for full-time. So it left us a little bit of a scramble, not to mention my learning curve just coming to the Commonwealth didn't help. Uh, what either. do you mean, not for full-time? They're not running any full-time academies as of present, and the word around the campfire is it's, is it's not going to. 
So that caused us to look at other places. There's one in Lowell, there's one in Methuen, there's one in Averill, there's one in Reading. But again, they operate, really it's a scatter shot as far as when they schedule them and it oftentimes is not in timing with, uh, with our budget cycle. We've, we've decided that there's probably three that we could feasibly use. Uh, and I've made outreaches to each one of those trying to get their schedule and, and trying to understand and then craft our hiring process around that schedule. Reading Lowell and Methuen and maybe Haverhill. Uh, so again, it does continue to, to create an, an issue for us. One of the things we are hoping is there are some certified applicants uh, that are slated to be interviewed over the next couple weeks. Uh, none, I believe, are full-time certified, but the reserve training does give us an option of being able to waive the full-time academy for a period of time, which would give us some breathing room and, and certainly would help with the scheduling part. So you'd be able to put them on? Get them training, get them and going. And send them to the academy. But, yeah, correct. It's a 270-day waiver, I believe, or something along them lines. But again, I'm putting the cart before the horse a little bit as to determining whether or not they're the most qualified applicant. But there are a few in the pike, and uh, that we will be knowing more probably by the uh, by Thanksgiving break. I'll uh, we'll, okay. we'll focus in a little bit more on that one opening that we do have full time. And doing that, we can stack the academies that we don't have two people in at the same time. Hopefully. So you're who are you getting for applicants? Are are you getting you know like full certified, experienced police? The, this process started off, we got 70 applications out, out of the gate. I added probably another 10 by the time we really got the steam going. Uh, there were a number of full-time academy uh, qualified people. However, several of them didn't make it through the process, uh, and several of them were passed over. Nobody that was full-time certified was left at the end, save Jim Landy. Hmm. So I, I've talked with uh, Chief about this in the past. I think if we do, and I do anticipate some retirements in fiscal 20, certainly, um, if and when we do need to re-advertise and restart from the beginning, it's a pretty significant undertaking. I think we should entertain a signing bonus for full-time applicants, to be quite honest. Uh, if we were to, to float out a, 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 a bonus, it would save us a ton of money uh, should we be able, to be able to attract somebody. Thinking about you know, looking at the pay, the benefits, and all those com competitive uh, features and us selling the agency as the place to be, that may be an enticing factor that would uh, could bring some people out from some of those towns there. Uh, maybe right around our competitive level uh, would be something we could explore. Because certainly, even if you gave a $5,000 signing bonus, I'm not joking when I'm telling you that's probably a twenty-five dollars or $30,000 savings even in the beginning stages of the hiring process. And that's not that's not unheard of. Uh, I'd like you to explore any possible ones with short experience officers in town instead of having to go through the academy process. Right. That's just not You're going to spend that $5,000 when they're in the academy? 3000 on the tuition. Yeah. <laughs> right off the shoot. Well, plus you've got gear. somebody that's... And then all the gear to go to the cabin. Yeah. yeah. It's way over. Yeah, and, and I mean, it delays when they could start. Yeah, because for a year out. And we become a training ground. And the other risk you run, too, is that if you are looking for the, the qual most qualified applicants, you're not alone. Uh, we, as a profession, are in a, are in a recruiting nightmare, really, quite honestly. And I think we're only reaching the bottom of it. I think when... Uh, the target demographic for recruitment becomes the, the Ferguson generation comes up. The kids that were in middle school during Ferguson, Missouri, and all that becomes our target demographic. I think we're in quite a bit of trouble. So I, I do think that you need to make it as attractive as you possibly can uh, to do that. And it, it, it is very expensive. Jeff had made mention. We're tracking these expenses a little bit better this time around. And it's my understanding uh, before we even shipped our guy off this last time around, we were around ten thousand dollars in expenses before he even sat in the academy. Uh, for day one. So it is a significant thing. Second time around, some of that equipment can be repurposed, uh, so there is a little bit that we can save there, but nonetheless, it is an expensive endeavor to get somebody to, to the academy. No question. I'll entertain any creative. So there's an elephant in the room, and I'm going to talk about it. Um, retiree health care. We're one of how many towns? Six. Six towns. Out of how many? 351. Right? I would say five. That, that clearly plays a role in attracting people from agencies that, that have that benefit. That there are many officers out there, for whatever reasons, that are looking to move, maybe because of geographic areas or a job change that, of their spouses, they're looking for a move. But they're going to give up their medical insurance. 
is really a big thing to, to cover. Is that something we should be starting to look at? Well, I, I'm saying it, it's going to have to maybe go in the back burner a little bit, but can we start thinking about how we would fund that? Sure, the town has taken it up before, mm -hmm. it's been shot down, um, I think at least twice, right, at town meeting? Well, no, I don't think it ever got to town meeting. It okay. did? All right. Maybe it's a matter of communicating and educating folks, because how long can you be a police officer? 365 to 65. And I, I think it is, there's a number of things we can unpack from that. Number one is when I started this conversation, we started with recruitment and thinking about recruitment. You can't really even talk about recruitment without talking about its twin, which is retention. Your best recruiting tool is point. retention. There's no question about that. From a fiscal standpoint, it, it makes it that way, but also your people sell your agency. They're your best recruiters. There's no question about that. No campaign poster uh, can make up from that. So there's that part of it. The other thing that I think presents itself when you're dealing with uh, the, the retiree health care, particularly here in the Commonwealth, uh, it looks to me like you could have an officer that stays on way past his prime uh, to a point where he doesn't isn't necessarily effective uh, for or doesn't the reason want to. correct for the reason of hanging on right until uh, it's Medicare that kicks in or something. Like Medicare sixty three, yeah. I think, or something. Sixty five. This is sixty five. So, so you're definitely you're definitely running that risk, and this is a young man's profession. I don't think that that can be argued. Uh, when you get to that age, uh, hanging on for those last couple of years because you may have some health issues, you may be in a situation uh, where your spouse or, or a significant other has an issue as well. So I do think that they need to be talked about in concert because I do think that they are very much uh, are variable in, in each other. I think any objective look at where we are with personnel and any growth of our department, we need to look at that as a key component to maybe it doesn't attract, maybe it does attract. I think if you put it on the list of 25-year-old kids considerations, I'm not going to lie, it's going to be at the bottom. I don't think a 25-year-old kid thinks that. But I do think if we're looking at trying to get people here that have experience, that have been trained, that come with a level of, uh, of training and experience, that certainly is a consideration. I think when you have children, your, your uh, thought process changes quite a bit. So it all depends on what target demographic you're looking at, but I certainly think when you put together an all-hazards approach when it comes to recruiting and retaining, I think that retiree health care does lock, loom very large. Uh, Chair, it's generally an issue more so for public safety, police and fire, because they can retire um, at age 55. Right. So you're not Medicare eligible till 65. So there's a 10 year gap um, that is, is a real issue. Um, general group, uh, you know, clerical administrative group doesn't have that same issue. It's not as dire a situation because we're generally not retiring at age 55. Um, we're working until we're Medicare eligible. Still doesn't give us that supplemental that um, retiree health care would provide, but it's not as dire an issue as it is for, for public safety employees. Yeah, the big issue is where's the money coming from? Okay, and what we had talked about back a while ago, and it never happened, was to be able to um, find the money from something like health care, our contribution. Um, and unfortunately, it's what you said, young people sometimes aren't thinking about what's gonna happen 20 years from now when I don't wanna do this job anymore and I don't have healthcare insurance. I think the fact that you've seen it bargained out of collective bargaining agreements in the past 20 years indicates just that. And it's, we've looked to our sister in the South Rhode Island where the old guys vote in their best interest when it's their time to negotiate a contract. And when the young guys take over and they are the, the majority in the union, it swings the other way and the things that suffer are retiree and benefit related issues. I think a stipend is what they do in New Hampshire, uh, which again, I, I, don't, I don't recall being you know, a great benefit that I look toward, forward to. I, I still thought I would have to work if I was to retire at 55 until I was 65 because I, it, it's geared towards a one-person or two-person family plan. When you retire at 55 and you still have three children, that's not what it was designed to do, despite that. Uh, it, was, it was designed to kind of account for a one-person or two-person plan. So I think there's a whole series of, of choices that you could float out there as to how you handle the retiree health care issue. It doesn't well, have to be all Well, if we're one of how many? Six. Six out of 351. I can tell you financially, 
we are in an envious position because of that, because other post-employment benefit um, accounting and funding is an enormous issue. Uh, you, you, if you offer retiree health insurance, you're then taking um, on the, the financial burden of looking at your entire workforce. There's an actuarial table that, that runs out, you know, life expectancy and length of service, and you've got to begin funding that. And mm -hmm. there's a schedule that um, is going to only get worse in terms of how much you need to fund and how soon. And there are communities that are you know, upwards of tens of millions of dollars in OPEB liability, and we're not in but that But part of the reason that they are in that situation is because they were not proactive about identifying a source for that money. Correct. Okay? We're in an enviable position because we haven't taken it on yet, so we can work to try to figure that out. How would we fund it? All right? And I think but, there's, a, there's a file, I think, that goes back to 14. Um, yeah, that I remember there, there was seeing a, it all. Right, there was a table, there was a table that was run on um, just as an estimate of what our open liability would be. So it wouldn't take much to dust that off. But again, I, you, your thinking is, is, I think, spot on. You need to do it hand in hand with identifying a funding source. Exactly. Because the expectation that um, within the existing operating budget that you're going to fund open liability, I think, is is a stretch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say, "Oh, let's do it." You you've got to have. It's it's like we're talking about roads. Sure. You you want the roads fixed? We have to have a financing plan for it. Right. You know, uh, nothing is nothing is free. Nothing is free in anybody's household. That's not free here either. So, uh, but I think if you if you plan for it and you look at what the different scenarios might be, then you're in a good place. So, I get concerned about retention. I get concerned about the fact that how do we make ourselves attractive? And it's not just what we offer in terms of pay and benefits. It's also what do we offer in terms of the community? What does our what does our school system look like? Um, you know how. What are the jobs in the area for maybe the spouses or or whatever? So there's lots of considerations that people look at, and if we want to be attractive, not just for our police but for everything, I think you know the fire chief is probably going to be talking about the same kind of issues. Mm -hmm. I think you have some of that. If you look at the departments in town, there are people who have been there for forever. They've done their whole careers in, in the police department, in the fire department in town. But my concern is what happens when they leave. Exactly. Okay? And that, what and that's happens why when some they people leave. will not come. Uh, that's right. So um, we have to think about ourselves in terms of how do we market our community as well. And that's a, that's a big plan. That's a big plan. But I, th I think we're we're in a good place to be able to start talking about that and dusting things off and figure out the future. It doesn't mean it's going to happen tomorrow. It doesn't mean it's going to happen in April. But maybe in two years it'll happen. Okay. My opinion. So, how many openings do you have right now? One. Yeah, we've, I, we've got a few people that we've identified uh, that are in process that could fill that full-time position, uh, but we still have a number of interviews to get through to determine. So we're not in bad shape. I do think we'll have to get right back to the chopping block to advertise again on anticipations because I do think the first half of fiscal 20 we will probably see a retirement if not two. So I do think we need to be prepared for that and always have a list that we can go to so that you're not dusting it off and starting from scratch. Really, uh, the 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 offer at the beginning can be very, very stiff and sometimes be three months. I think the people for this job showed up for their initial testing in March. So that gives you an idea of how long the process is. Uh, we got a lot of candidates, which was nice, and we had a lot of choices, which is nice. Uh, but again, that buffer can be three to six months without any, without any, uh, really any curveballs. One of the things we're doing is we're increasing the use of our reserves and hiring more reserves which can help fill gaps along the way when people are leaving. Okay. We all set? Yep. Cars. Talk cars. So I'll start at the beginning. We, um, we had $45,000 appropriated for fiscal 19 uh, under the thought process that we could fund one or at least four. 
Uh, I think that figure was uh, a little less than it should be. Uh, so we could, we could, it's still very workable and there's a number of options that we could do. But I thought I'd start off with a, a state of the fleet. We have six patrol vehicles and three admin vehicles. Um, of the six uh, patrol vehicles, one's out of service with a blown engine. Um, I'm working back and forth with Ford to find out whether or not they'll do something with us. It was only a few months out of warranty, believe it or not. Um, we have three that with mileages ranging from 92,000 to 130,000. And on our admin uh, fleet, we have ranges from 46,000 to about 80,000. So we have a number of equipment needs which really drive that cost up. I think leasing four vehicles for $45,000 is very doable. I've checked interest rates as of today. Um, I've, I've been uh, keeping my eye on it. Interest rates are rising, as you very well know. In fact, I think when I did this research last year at this time, I think we were still scoring 3% now. The best rate I could get quickly was 5 So I'll continue to shop, but that just gives you an idea of how fluid the area is. The equipment needs for the fleet really drive uh, my decisions a lot, though. There was some neglect on that fleet for a very long time, so as of now, there is a need to replace light bars and cages and storage boxes and control systems. Um, those are things that would not normally be able to have to be replaced on an annual schedule or a triannual schedule, certainly not an annual schedule. Uh, but it's been a long time, they've been neglected for a, a period of time. So there is a significant uh, curve when it comes to re replacing equipment to get those things out there in a safe manner. Our radios and MDTs, which are big cost drivers, are taking uh, care of in other lines that we have planned for. We have an article uh, that was passed at town meeting for MDTs. Um, so we're good on that front, and the fire chief and, uh, and, and uh, the chief and I are working together uh, to put together a radio plan. So that those needs are done, but regardless, the equipment needs are, are pretty significant. So the base amount of 45000 would lease four vehicles at the base rate, but then uh, we would have about $75,000 in equipment needs. Uh, the full cost of, of one, if we decided to just buy one, would be 55000 So our choices really are we could buy one, we could take that $45,000 and apply it to it. I could take $10,000 out of drug forfeiture fund and make that work. Um, however, I would be back in a month and a half recommending that we went with a lease for our three vehicles because I think that that's the need. Um, if we went with the lease, um, the, we would ask for a three-year capital lease not to exceed a certain amount of uh, a number. It would be my recommendation we went with 55000 took 10000 for drug forfeiture to make it work. I would be back here in the fall. I mean, in the, uh, in the spring asking for next year for that line to be funded so it would work. Uh, and that would take a, a, a significant load off of us. Um, there's a, there's a, there are a number of benefits with going with it. The first benefit is it certainly does smooth out costs. I would be able to then tell you what the cost for that new equipment line would be for fiscal 20, for fiscal 21, and, and for, no, it would be 19, 20, and 21. Um, we wouldn't have the ebb and flow. I think what has happened over the years is there's not a need for one patrol vehicle or two patrol vehicles every year. It ebbs. Some years it's two and then two and then the next year we only need one. This kind of smooths out that spike that, you, that you'll that actually see. Keeps the, the vehicles under warranty uh, for the entire time of the lease and then some, which really does help us in a, in a lot of different ways. Uh, one of the things that I've been challenged with here is the, the, the ability to analyze anticipated and unanticipated equipment costs for us, or vehicle costs for us rather. Uh, we have a number of vehicles that are aging, they've been out of warranty for a long time, very difficult to budget those types of things. Uh, the water pump blows in this one, which we have one over at Townsend Florida as we speak, uh, with a water pump issue. Having a newer fleet allows us to then analyze and actually put those things into the two buckets. Are these you know, foreseeable, anticipated costs of maintenance of having a vehicle, a certain amount of oil changes, tires, those things, and then the other pile of unanticipated. Uh, excessive brake use, transmissions here and there, it makes it easier to do that and I submit to you that the very least stabilizes our cruiser maintenance line if not reduces it in spending. Are, are you saying if, if you do a lease, it's a three year lease? Yeah. And then the car goes back to them? No, we own it. It's a capital lease. It's for a, a dollar lease. we own it at okay. the end. Yeah. All right. So that's why you have to figure in the, the maintenance after that point. Correct. Right. So one of the things I would say is I, I, I maintain a fleet uh, 
very much like this book oh, before I say that. The other, the other thing about the, the, the cost of, of dealing with this is the indirect cost of one having to maintain an aging fleet. There's a built-in cost that uh, we do not have a cruiser maintenance person, so there's people on staff driving these things through the various appointments and tracking that type of thing. Building these things is a monster. Jeff is in the room, he's, he's helped you greatly when it comes to doing the research uh, that you have to do to, to choose the right equipment. It's very fluid. Uh, it changes with model years, and I mean, there's a, there's a lot to it. So there's a lot of time that you would invest in outfitting a cruiser. Uh, so to do that every three years versus every year does uh, help us quite a bit. Um, I've had proven success with this model. Um, I, would, I just made contact with Joe Hobeck, the Chief and Hollis, who replaced me, um, and he did he re upped his leases again another time. Um, and my numbers were we reduced vehicle costs 11% over a 10 year average, and that's not adjusted to inflation, which is incredible. Um, not to mention a fuel reduction in that same period of time. He re upped again this year with those same numbers, so it's level for another three year lease, which would push that 10 year up, up to be more than a dozen. It's close to about 15 years of level cost when it comes to fleet management, uh, where I can I can guarantee you when you study, and I've only studied five or six years of this budget, it was volatile. One year it would be, it would be 45, the next year they'd have to put in for two cars. Um, so it, it, you have these spikes and you end up having a, you have the same uh, title of argument every year. I thought for a while we were doing two cars a year. Right, yeah. yeah. So when you do the one, it really, and they did one, the first year, this last year we did one, and I want I want to say the time before that Jeff was two, but the time before that was one. Three years ago, it changed from two cars a year down yeah. to one. And that really kind of set us back. But even I'm glad you mentioned that because even if we did that and went to that model, we'd be talking a hundred thousand dollars a year, not the fifty that I'm saying is probably a good uh, a good start to do that. So I've talked to uh, finance. I've talked to the to the treasurer that had left. And their opinion was, in Hollis, how I did it was our leasing agreement had a non-appropriations clause, uh, which covered us for not having to go to town meeting and, and dealing with it that way. The auditors here and the treasurer and the finance person all felt as though it would be best to group that together and do as an article for uh, the town meeting. Uh, we, would, we already have the first year of the lease funded. Uh, we would be asking that you transfer the money or use that money to pay for the lease. The language is very similar to the language that was used for the ambulance a few years ago. I don't remember what year, Jim, you remember what year that was? Um, so I've got the language that we would need, and we can certainly submit that by the 20th, and basically the language is, is that you would ask that the sum of that amount uh, be used as the first year lease year agreement for the purchase and equipping of a new police car in this instance, and as may be necessary thereof to authorize the town to enter into a lease purchase agreement for the period up to or in, in excess of three years for such purposes. And that, what that would do is that would guarantee that lease payment for the subsequent years, thus not needing a non-appropriations clause. So, <clears throat> how do you do that? I thought you couldn't commit to more than what you're appropriating that year. Okay. I mean, ambulance, I understand, because that's a revolving account, right? I, I don't think the funding source is as much the issue as that there truly is a non-appropriations issue. And, and we have Adam here, you can probably speak to it. You can't commit to that second and third year exactly. payment legally. Yeah, see, that that's what's confusing me. Hearing that that's what they're recommending, we can't commit to more than one year. But you, you what, what the deputy is saying is you have, you can have language in that lease agreement. They come that, standard, quite frankly. That says, okay. you know, there's no that guarantee if you don't that you're appropriate it, right, if so the town says no, right. then what, the car goes back? Which everybody recognizes is <laughs> not, <laughs> not likely to happen. It becomes an Uber. <laughs> Which we need to tell. Don't push it. <laughs> we've, we've seen uh, similar contracts, lease agreements, um, not necessarily with police vehicles. Um, and they always contain standard language that it's subject to appropriation, as most of your municipal contracts do. So the other contracting party is well aware of that. If they deal with municipalities with some frequency, as I imagine these providers do, they're going to recognize that that's a risk. Um, it, it's a cost-benefit analysis for them. And I think in most communities, they get the appropriation because the argument's made that, well, if we don't do it this way, we're going to have to buy new vehicles. So one way or the other, we need, we need the equipment. Okay. 
So it was the it was the, the uh, it was Lori's um, suggestion that we put it on the article. And given given the conversation, I'm not so sure what that accomplishes, uh, but I certainly would be willing to, to put that language together and get it to the office by the 20th. That that's what it was. Where does this fit with capital planning? The car it was approved came, last we year. The car came in through capital planning last year. Well, the the the, well, the amount of forty five thousand came in through right. capital planning. The discussion was left that the chief and the deputy would come before the select board to have a discussion about whether it would be a, a purchase one or lease some number, which is what this is. So if the board takes the position that the lease is something you'd like to pursue, then we would work with council to determine whether we needed the article that uh, the town cap is talking about or whether we go with the standard three year with the non appropriations clause. But really, what, it begins and ends with you. If, if you think when, I, when we addressed the issue last year with capital, it had been on the capital plan uh, funded through 2022 at uh, various levels, with 78,000 and 8 to 86,000 depending on the year, because as Jeff had mentioned, they were toggling back and forth on a car or two cars. I'm suspicious of those numbers because those numbers don't mean anything to me. I'm not sure I could do anything with either one of them. It doesn't look like either one of them is two cars, and certainly they're both more than one. So I'm not really sure how they arrived at that figure. But suffice to say, it was it was contemplated by capital at a higher level than what we would be asking for for the for the 50,000 or 55,000. I would ask that it not exceed 55,000 and out because I could uh, very well look to other places in my uh, budget for fiscal 19 to get me over the hump and then come back for next year and ask for that new equipment line, which we would probably retitle at that point uh, to be a cruiser maintenance line or cruiser line or something along that lines, level funded to whatever that lease payment was. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I've, spoke, uh, I've spoken with Jay a couple of times now about this, um, and I think it's financially for the town, I think it's in their best interest to do this long term. Um, the one thing you did mention um, was consistency and safety, um, knowing that if Officer Giles is getting in one car, it's the same car as the one next to it, and not have to worry where the gun is, or the shotgun is, or the radio is, so um, an ability to standardize the fleet. And Do the you have flight. to worry about that now? Yes. Every car has yes. different quarters. That concerns me a lot. So I usually use one car. I don't want you to have to worry about things like that. That's why we wanted to try to have a consistent fleet across the board. What's and happening is he can, he'll use the same car every day, but if he can say that car is... Yeah, we'll work with someone else that usually uses that same car. Then I'll give it to another car. Well, I mean, uh, go on vacation. And, and yeah. even yeah. even better than that, though, if you're going to manage the miles on your car to make it work, sometimes you cannot pack miles on one car. I mean, that's why one has 130,000 and one has 70. That's crazy talk. You should, they should be modulated so that you have... And in order to do that, you do need to assign them to different people all the time to make sure that they're fresh and that those miles are being spread out amongst that fleet. Virtually impossible to do if you have uh, what Jeff is describing, which is you have different in equipment. And when stress, you interact, you know, you interject stress into the, to the mix, uh, you can really make it an, an unsafe situation. So we really did think we built the last two, Jeff, I think, are pretty consistent. Yes, um, and we kind of have tried to put this build together on a manner to make it more uniform across the plate so that when you grab a keys and you run outside, it is the same car as best as you can. There's, you can't make it perfect, but as close as possible to release the weapon system or, or to activate the lights or siren because when you're amped up and then there is something in an emergency uh, happening, you certainly don't want to have to think about that or refer to a cheat sheet or something crazy. Okay, can we get back to the, the capital plan? So $45,000 came out of capital for this? The 45 we have now? It's, it's referenced in capital plan, but it is budgeted as a operating budget expense. That doesn't make sense to me. Somebody can explain it to me at another time, okay? I don't want to get into it now. But anyway. Um, it's in our budget. $45,000 is in our budget. In our I, but, <laughs> anyway. Um, it makes sense to me, and it makes more sense to me now that I understand it's not a lease the way that, like, my husband leased his Nissan okay that after five years he either buys it at a given price or gives it back it's as if you're making payments on it for three years so you're calling it a lease because they have you haven't really transferred ownership until it's paid for and it's a three-year payment 
Is, am I understanding that right? Okay. So in terms of explaining it to the public, to town meeting, it's not a lease like we're used to doing at a personal level. It's more a three-year payment plan to pay for the vehicle that then becomes ours. Exactly. Right. That's the that, well. That that was one of the recommendations that I, I gave to the BD chief last time is to be prepared at town meeting for a presentation um, to explain that because that's going to be a big question. It's not like a consumer no. car lease. Right. Okay. So that, that's hear, a big part of it. Sure. When I hear lease, I look the it, same exactly. way. So if you go over exactly. twelve thousand miles a year, you're paying thirty cents a mile. Mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. so. so are there limitations at all? No. There aren't any. Okay, so it's a way for communities to be able to purchase vehicles on time, really. I think it's designed to smooth those costs out over a period of time. That's that's going to be my mm -hmm. my take. I think it makes it sounds like it will help to make things costs more predictable, budget more predictable. Yes, certainly. And I think that's very important to today too. So. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm for it. Yep. How, how often would the equipment expense pop? Yeah, I, that's a great question. Ford generally says you can get three to five years out of a model. So generally speaking, up north, I, I found that I was re replacing at much less intervals because I literally could plug and play. Uh, so I didn't have to replace the light bar every year, which is a significant expense. I think a 3000 bucks or something on the way. Uh, just, that's just one piece of equipment that I'm referencing, and there's, like I said, seventy-six thousand dollars divided by four. You can get an understanding of how expensive the equipment is. So they can be repurposed, and it's not unusual to get five to even seven or eight years out of electronic equipment. It depends. It's changing a little bit. Uh, manufacturers seem less apt to stand behind their products more than five years, but generally speaking, you should be able to repurpose, and you should at least get one change over. So conceivably, and I think that's how I was able to level costs up there, is that third year, I didn't have, I could, re, I could release again under that same figure because even if the vehicles got more expensive, I really didn't matter because I didn't have to replace as much equipment. And then I did it again when it came uh, the, the third time, I'd have to start replacing uh, the re equipment that had aged or broke or, or something along those lines. But it does not have to be every time. So at that three year mark, what is your experience with the car? Were there some that you, you cycle back through the organization or others that you just access? Most definitely. Bid. Up up north, what I did once it started to go was we had six vehicles just like we had here, and the three went into the reserve line and the three went to the front of the line. So I kept the ones from the old lease as backup vehicles for details, for court, right, for basic transports, maybe for the school resource officer or something along them lines, as support vehicles, and moved all the new ones to the front. And at the end of the lease, I would do it over again. There was always one or two that were out of whack and I might trade them in or there was, you know, it's certainly uh, ebbs based on what had happened. Maybe we told one in between or something along the lines. So there's always some variables to take into account. But very rarely uh, were they not used in a support capacity after. It would, would it make most sense, do you think, if the decision is to go with the lease to seek the equipment funding right out of the gate as opposed to bleeding it out over the next year? Yes, in fact, I, I, the, 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 just doing a quick math, if we if we authorized a lease payment of up to 55 or six, certainly $60,000, that would roll that all together and get it all done. I would be able to buy four, and that's actually probably a conservative estimate because we do have some trading value for some of the, of the vehicles we have in stock. So that, that would be a conservative uh, estimate, so that would be a good, so, so it would be a vote to authorize the lease of up to four vehicles with an additional appropriation needed of 15. Correct. Because you have for fiscal 19. If right. we did, if we decided to do it that way, that would be the preferred way. That would be that's Christmas morning. I say do it. Yep. Do you need a vote, or do you want to just do it? I think if you give him a vote, I think that's that's going to make him sleep a little better tonight, knowing well, that people that sleep. <laughs> Yes, that would be nice. Wayne. Uh, Jeff and I have no more hair to pull. Move to go forward with the um, warrant. Or article or the lease of. Move the board approve moving forward um, the warrant article for the lease of four police meetings. Four, right? Yes. I'll, sec I'll second that. 
All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Discuss. Thank you. Big safety thing, too. Yeah. Jim, you're up. Uh, let's see. Certainly. Um, next is a discussion regarding the creation of a master or all department board and committee email group list for the purpose of improved communication. I know, Madam Chair, you and I have talked about this. Mm -hmm. and, um, it's something that I know you felt particularly strong, strongly about. We have boards and committees now that are using their personal email addresses. Um, so when we're looking to create one master list, we'd oftentimes be looking to take people's private email addresses, which is probably not the best thing. And it also creates issues under the open meeting law when you're doing public, public business through your private email address. So the idea would be with the update that we're doing right now to the system and um, creation of additional seats or availability of email addresses would be to have standard for each board that the chair would have of each board would have access to it would be you know conservation at town dot uh, you know, townsend dot ma dot us have everybody have an official government email address then have one grouping uh, throughout look where there'd be uh, the ability to hit everybody at the same time with one master list so that's, that's kind of what's been in my, my mind about it since we've talked. I don't know if you have some additional thoughts. Um, <laughs> I'd be happy if they just did a, their own little Gmail account just for the town purposes. Yeah. All right? I, mean, I have three or four, four email accounts that I have set up. I happen to set mine up with Comcast. You could do it with Gmail. I have one for the Board of Selectmen. So it makes it easy if somebody has a public records request or whatever. Um, Comcast keeps it as long as I want them to keep it. And there's a ton of space there, so I don't have any issues, all right? Um, I have it for the building committee. I have one for um, that I had for the FinCom that I maintain because it, they are public records. And um, I have my own, my personal one. Do I get them mixed up once in a while? Yeah, sometimes I do. <laughs> I clicked the wrong one. But, uh, but, but for the most part, you know, I stick to, if I'm doing business for Selectman, I'm on that Selectman email account. And I can be sure that everything that I've done is there and I'm in compliance with public records and open meeting. Um, so I think there needs to be a communication to all boards, committees, that it's extremely important that we maintain our public records and that we can do it through the town. You can have an email account if we have the capability of setting that up or create your own separate account for, for town business. Um, the benefit, there's another benefit to that. In, in the liaison role, I have noticed in, in three different meetings that I've gone to that we don't do a heck of a good job at communicating from one board to another what, what we're up to. Um, I find out a lot and they find out a lot from me because you know what? Everybody doesn't listen to these meetings. Everybody doesn't turn them on. Everybody doesn't even have cable yet, which is another story. Um, so I just, um, I think it's a good way to make sure that we can send out a blast to everybody and you know, we're gonna have an open meeting law sure. seminar and we're gonna, because we're just the board of selectmen. There are other elected boards in town too, and we want to be able to communicate with them. And some people don't want us to use their personal email accounts. And they don't want us to share their personal email address. I don't care, I don't want to, but 
give me something where I can contact you to let you know what's going on. So that's where I'm coming from with it. I don't know how Wayne feels about it. I don't think it's a big deal to ask for that. So. Okay. I agree with you. So can we at least, uh, I, I don't care if it gets done internally or not, and I'm not sure I want to put that burden on our IT folks either. Understood. But to just send something out to everybody saying, we need an email address at least for one person, at the chair of your board. And, and if people have concern about the, um, well, the fact that it's their private email, that they're using, aside from open meeting issues. You can just create a new email account, go to Gmail. And, and even if they didn't, those, we, can create, we can create one line list. You know, when, exactly. when you're seeing you know, these, these undisclosed recipient lists, we can create that as well, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Lovely. Um, next, you'll see, is a discussion regarding special town meeting warrant articles that we've received to date. And I have copies of draft document that um, we'll go over what was in as of he's got one. Okay. what we've got to date so looking at the article one prior year fiscal or financial articles nothing to date but in case something pops that's always a placeholder article two would be looking at seventy five hundred dollars for a budget for the American flag committee it's something that um, this board has spent a lot of time with that committee over the last year and next you'd see $35,000 which would be supplement the legal expense account and this would be relative to an expenditure that we made earlier in the year for a legal settlement. Mm -hmm. Next you would see the personal service account in the police department and that would be um, some discussion around a grievance that we settled earlier this evening and some other costs we heard the chief and the deputy mention some unanticipated costs for the training at the academy. <coughs> Turning the page to article 5 you'd see a $4,500 request to supplement the audit services expense, expense account submitted by the town accountant um, and Lori would be able to speak to the details of what that additional expense is. Article 6, 3900 for facilities expense account. And this is replacing repairing the relay electric electronic start of the <laughs> elevator. Um, just, you want to share that? Yeah, just, just today. Um, well, actually, a, a week ago we had an issue with this, and it, it, it froze the elevator out, and the technicians came out, and they did a, a temporary repair for us, and we were concerned that it would get us through the election, at least, and they assured us that we'd be fine. Um, Today at about, what was it, about 10 o'clock? About 10 o'clock when we had hundreds of people coming through the town hall, the elevator stopped working. Um, <laughs> Kathy, to her great credit, Kathy got uh, right to the Secretary of State's office. They gave us a workaround so we could have somebody sitting downstairs taking um, ballots if people um, weren't able to access the second floor where the main voting was taking place for. Um, I'm sorry, I'm laughing because when you called me and told me that, Jim was offering to help people. <laughs> and the workers' comp case piggybacking people up the stairs. But um, the, the Secretary of State gave us the answer. They said, take, take ballots downstairs and carry them up with one of the wardens if necessary. Didn't need to do that um, because the elevator company got out really quickly and was able to take care of it, get it operational again. So this Article 6 is seeking an appropriation to be able to replace those components. Uh, Article 7, $7,500 for the purpose of funding an update to the roadway pavement management plan. And this is, again, a discussion for the board when we get set to finalize. Uh, Chapter 90 funds would be an appropriate use to fund this, as opposed to going mm -hmm. to a town meeting warrant. Um, so that's, that's there as, uh, as a placeholder for that discussion. Article 8 would be $2,100 to do um, replacing or repairing the rifle strap on the John Bernie Blood Monument, and this comes in from the Cemetery and Parks Commissioners. If you look at the monument, um, at some point in time, the, the strap was, was removed. I, I don't know if it was removed for maintenance purposes or if it was removed through vandalism and then subsequently rediscovered, but the fact remains that it, it needs attention, and this is their, their article to do that. Article 9 would be $46,000 for the truck-mounted 
ground, ground speed spreader controls being able to be repurposed for roadside mower or vice versa, which way is that? So that Capital plan actually approved the ground speed spreader right. if he wants to use that towards the So basically, this isn't seeking an additional appropriation, it's seeking to repurpose an existing okay. authorization. Article 10 is $66,360 to fund the fiscal 19 capital plan, specifically for the purpose of the Towns and Fire EMS Department's Medic 1. This is one you may remember we had a discussion about at the end of the the annual town meeting that had been authorized but didn't make the final list for the capital plan. Next you'll see a placeholder account for um, repairing and replacing a portion of the roof at 274 Main Street, which um, we don't yet have the quotes on that for. And that, that's the, um, the recreation the annex. Next, Article 12 would be $5,900 for purchasing land use database application to be used by the land use departments to include conservation planning and zoning or take any other action. Um, this one is still in flux, that's a placeholder, but um, the original consideration of a, of a type of software wouldn't have been as robust as everybody seems to think would be better. Um, it, it would not create one master file for all addresses, which we've talked about doing. So. Any time an issue comes up with, you know, XYZ Main Street, you're able to go to that file and you can see what the zoning history is, what the planning history is, what the conservation, Board of Health. Um, so this number may change depending on some other information that's going to be gathered between now and then. Have we looked to the state for this stuff too? That's part of what's being done now. Okay. This came in from Michelle, who is the... Uh, the relatively new land use coordinator and it's a product she's used in the past. Well, I'm just thinking of best practices and stuff. Certainly. There might be something there for yep. us. And Article 13 would be consideration of some number of funds for professional technical costs for the charter review. And this comes in um, just as of last week, I gather, from the, the last charter review committee meeting. Article 14 is one that's become customary. Um, to my understanding, to replenish reserve fund for the Finance Committee. So to the extent that they've taken any hits early, um, replenishing that fund for their consideration and use later in the year. Stabilization articles, one would be to appropriate to the stabilization fund proper and the other for the capital stabilization fund. Next you have bylaws and adoptions. There are just some bullet points there. One is for revision to the enforcement for parking violations, which we may or may not need. I know that um, Town Council Costa and Deputy Chief uh, Sartell have gone back and forth on that issue, so we may need to tweak that bylaw, we may not. Um, unregistered vehicles, um, this is one that the chair has been particularly <laughs> interested in getting changed, so it's no longer the select board that is the sole authorized entity to do these. Don't know I'm getting used to it. These visits, <laughs> well, we, can, we can just designate you by name then. And then one for the I town. I could be the official unregistered motor vehicle person for the town. Town Properties Committee is the other, and that's one that we had a discussion about just last week. So then you get into um, adoptions and zoning bylaws, and there's one coming in from the planning board for a temporary moratorium on recreational or adult use marijuana establishments, and this would seek to extend the existing moratorium by another six months out until June 28th of 2019 or until a bylaw is earlier approved. We expect that there may or may not be, we're not certain, the one coming in on accessory use apartments, um, which would also um, be something that would appear here. Correct. So there, there may be more. Um, there may be tweaks to some of these and some of them may yet disappear. But as of today in the file, this is what we have. And, um Town Council has everything. Just got a copy of it just now. And, and these, these are. And backup for whatever. Not yet. He okay. literally just was handed one tonight. Okay. And, uh, mm. it, this isn't anything that I would suggest you even spend a lot of time with because it's, it's just very, very rough in draft. The one. Right. Well, the one for the American Flag American Committee. American Flag Committee. I would have the same response to that as if I saw something from the Housing Authority, which is we generally aren't doing recurring operating budget articles at the special because 
Oh, tax, that, yeah, tax rate part of the budget. We're, yeah, yeah, we're at you know the levy at the levy limit. So, what we're dealing with here are things that would be appropriate uses for one-time revenues, which would be the certified free cash. So you, you know, it, it gets a little dicey if you start funding operating budgets out of free cash. That's right. Yeah, I agree. We're back. A April would be a better time. All right. Um, I, I, I misspoke. There are actually a couple of things left. One is that we received notification from the Commonwealth that um, our Chapter 90 apportionment has been increased. So we're set to receive a supplemental amount of $83,334. Um, so that's good news, particularly when we're looking at the pavement management plan and, and mm -hmm. some of the things we're looking to, to accomplish with that uh, roadway program. And additionally, um, we received notification that Lindsay Butler Yeah. Uh, Lindsay Butler um, has success successfully completed the Mass Association of Conservation Commission's Fundamentals for Conservation Commission's training course. Um, so there'd be a, a recommendation that a letter go to Lindsay for her file, which we've done with people that have um, have uh, passed this training course in the past. So it would be, we wish to extend our sincere congratulations in successfully completing MACC's Fundamentals for Conservation Commissioner's training course. We understand the goal of the Fundamentals course is to provide the basic knowledge and practical tools essential to carry out the many responsibilities that come with being a dedicated employee of the Towns and Conservation Commission. Best wishes for continued success in your professional development and serving the Commission and the Town of Townsend on behalf of the Town of Townsend by the Select Board. So if it's pleasure of the board, um, a vote to execute um, such a document to recognize Lindsay's accomplishment. I vote the board to sign and accept the announcement for um, lost her name, Lindsay Butler, for the work on the Townsend Conservation Commission. I'll second that. Good job. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. So that's the basic uh, course. Correct. Let's take some more. Um, thank you. And that's all I have, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, Board of Selectmen announcements, updates, and reports. I just wanted to mention, and, and I thought we were going to put it on the agenda um, as, a, as a special one. There's a new person downstairs in the town clerk's office. Correct. What's her first name? Jess. Jess, Jess Funioli. Jess Funioli. So um, if you see her, she's the town clerk's new appointee for the assistant town clerk. Say welcome. Say hi. Welcome aboard. Wayne? Uh, I got nothing, but I do have an announcement for the next one. Okay, 6 3. Uh, Townsend BFW posts 6538 and it's auxiliary and American Legion post number. It's got writing on it, 199. Yep, 199. Um, and it's ladies and gentlemen, we'll honor all veterans who currently serve the military and all veterans of the earlier generation, including those who paid the ultimate sacrifice to maintain. Our country's freedom at a Veterans Day ceremony to be held at the VFW Park Monument in West Townsend on Sunday, November 11th, beginning at 11 a.m. The public is cordially invited to show their appreciation of those who served and those who still serve by attending the ceremony. Parents are strongly encouraged to bring their children to the ceremony so they may learn the importance of Veterans Day and what sacrifices were made to make our country great. Light refreshments will be served at the VFW Function Hall at 491 Main Street, West Townsend, following the 11 a.m. Veterans Day ceremony. Thank you. I do have one other thing. If you're a veteran and you're interested, they're doing a breakfast at the uh, the high school. The high school kids are doing that oh, on and Friday. You, and you get free golf on Veterans Day. Tell us Ridge Country Ooh, Club. Wow. So. Nice. Hmm? I didn't say it was going to be warm. <laughs> <laughs> Not 
And board correspondence, I have none. No. no. Approval of meeting minutes for October 2nd and October 10th. I move the board approve meeting minutes for October 2nd, 2018 and October 10th, 2018. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Six, six. Uh, I move the board review and sign payroll and bills payable warrants of session. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And we have two executive sessions. Yes, we do. So I move the board move back into executive session. Well, you have to I read it. Pursuant to GLC 30A, S21A3 to discuss strategy with respect to collecting bargaining and litigation in an open meeting that may have detrimental effect on the bargaining position for litigating position and the chair so declares the clerk union 2.3 executive session pursuant to GLC 30A S21A3 to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have detrimental effect on the bargaining position or litigating position and so the chair so declares Board of Health versus Janice Madela. Board of Health versus Loretta Lambert and Townsend Water Department versus Town of Townsend. Second. And the board declares on both. Roll call? Wayne Miller, yes, on both. Sue Lissio, yes. And um, we will not be returning Correct. to open session. So, good night, all.